7 a.m. Today's weather, sunny and clear, a high of 67, a nighttime low of 46. In local news, talk of annexation on the east side is being... What started out as a typical October day would suddenly change at 1.18 p.m. when a large blast rocked the east side and knocked out power to a large section of Evansville. The unexpected blast would kill one of Evansville's most successful and well-connected residents and leave many wondering who and why someone wanted him dead. Raymond John Ryan was born on January the 9th, 1904 in Watertown, Wisconsin. At an early age, Ryan found a love for gambling. Little did Ryan know that his love for gambling and taking risk would one day make him a millionaire. Ray Ryan landed at Evansville in the late 1930s. At that time, the regions of southwestern Indiana, southeastern Illinois, and western Kentucky were experiencing an oil boom. This boom brought many oil men, investors, and risk takers like Ryan to the area. By the 1940s, Illinois was the nation's third largest oil producing state. In the early days of the boom, Ryan took many risks on oil leases, often coming up empty handed. However, after time, the oil drilling business dealt him a winning hand. Ray Ryan had finally found a large oil reserve in southern Illinois near the Wabash River, north of Crossville. Ryan Oil Company quickly became one of the most successful oil businesses in the Midwest. At its peak, the company owned properties in 15 states. The success of those companies was largely credited to Ray's charm and his willingness to take chances. Due to the large amount of money needed to drill exploratory wells and to gamble on oil leases, Ryan would sometimes partner with investors of questionable backgrounds. These associations would eventually put him in contact with mob figures and play a role in his death. Even though Ryan Oil Company was becoming more and more successful, Ryan was always looking for more ways to make money. His quest for a larger fortune often involved him in ventures with real estate in places as far away as Kenya. While Ryan traveled the world and invested around the globe, he always made his home in Evansville. Through the 1950s, Ryan became a major player in Palm Springs, California. He bought and renovated the El Mirador Hotel, making it a destination for Hollywood stars. During the years that followed, he spent a lot of time hosting lavish parties uh, that were attended by high-profile friends at his Southern California getaway. Through the late 1950s and 60s, Ryan could be found partying, golfing, or playing cards with the likes of tennis star Bobby Riggs or actors John Wayne, Dean Martin, Bing Crosby, and his especially close friend, William Holden. While Ray Ryan was recognized as a successful businessman in Evansville, many local residents did not realize the extent of his gambling ventures. Among his friends and high rollers beyond Evansville, Ryan was known as a serious gambler. Uh, Ray was always in chasing oil no matter what. He was also chasing gambling, but he also chased oil. And sometimes they mixed. Uh, when he was gambling, they sometimes people put oil well leases up their stake in gambling. And Ray would try to win them if he thought they were good. And if they were good, well, he made money. If they weren't good, he lost. But Ray was used to that type of things. You know, sometimes you're gonna make it big, sometimes you're not. You just keep trying to make it big no matter what. Investigators would come to believe that Ryan's trouble with the mob stemmed from one of those card games. It was during a 1949 gambling session at the Las Vegas Flamingo with mobster Nick the Greek Dandolas that Ryan won a lot of money. Ray managed to get a series of poker games with Nick the Greek Dandolas. Nick the Greek, by that time, was the most famous, well-known gambler in the country. And Ray beat him, okay? This is probably, uh, I don't know, six, eight, maybe 10 days at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. And he beat, he beat uh, Nick the Greek out of probably a half a million dollars, according to Nick. And it took a year later that Nick found out that, or was told anyway, that Ray had cheated him out of the money. Investigators believe that Nick the Greek hatched a plan and presented it to the mob prior to the lawsuit. In 1963, Ryan was contacted by Marshall Caifano and Charles de Monaco, two known organized crime figures. The pair planned to extort $60,000 a year from Ryan for protection money and $15,000 owed to Nick the Greek. Well, when Domenico and, and Calfano were 
walking out of the hotel room with Ray. They talked about going for a ride in the desert so they could talk about uh, the money that they wanted from Ray. Ray wasn't really eager to go for a ride in the desert with these guys because most of the time you didn't come back. So he got to a corner. They were walking down the hallway. And actually, uh, uh, Nick the Greek was just somewhere in that area too. Anyway, they started walking down the uh, uh, corridor and Ray knew he had to get the hell out of there, okay? These guys were going to do something to him. And there came, uh, at that time, there came a, a bellboy with a, uh, one of those rolling carts with luggage on it. And Ray jumped on one side of the, um, the cart away from uh, Delmonico and Turin. And he, Ray started running for the front desk. And he's saying, you know, shoot me in the back. That's the way you guys do it. And he runs to the front desk. And uh, even though Ray knew Sam Giancana, who was the head of the uh, outfit at that time in Chicago, um, they thought that they could get this and it would be an easy mark. It didn't work out that way. And uh, Ryan, even though Giancana, Frank Costello, and other mob members told him not to go to the FBI, he did. He didn't realize that Cafano was a real, mean, violent street thug. With Ryan as a key witness, the FBI was able to charge Marshal Caifano and Charles Delmonico with extortion. Ryan's testifying against the mobster sealed the conviction. Caifano was given a 10-year prison sentence and Delmonico was given a five-year prison sentence. Investigators believe that these events led to Ryan's murder. On October 18, 1977, Raymond John Ryan was murdered at the Olympia Health Spa just east of Green River Road. The murder resembled a mob-style hit because it had been planned and carried out with precision and accuracy. The murders placed a bomb under the catalytic converter on the driver's side of Ryan's new Lincoln Continental Mark V. And the theory is that once he put the key in and turned it, that lit the blasting cap, sent a circuit surge of electricity, and then the, the device then exploded. The car was completely destroyed. Pieces were spread all over the area. The blast was heard across of the east side of Evansville. Windows of nearby houses and buildings were shattered, and power was knocked out along Green River Road. Ryan's body was hardly burned. Most of his injuries and the cause of his death were the result of the shock wave of the bomb. The citizens of Evansville were shocked by the vicious murder of Ray Ryan. Many could not understand why anyone would want to murder a successful oil man. The people of Evansville were fascinated with the murder. The death and its pending investigation would continue to make headlines in the months and even years that followed. On October 20th, 1977, Raymond John Ryan's funeral was held at Fountain Terrace Funeral Home. The service lasted about 20 minutes and was attended by about 30 friends and family members, including movie star William Holden. The entrance of the funeral home was guarded by two uniformed Evansville police officers. Other city police officers, along with agents from various federal agencies, were also in the area watching who showed up. The jurisdiction of the investigation became a turf war between the FBI, ATF, and local law enforcement. Through combined efforts, the agencies handled thousands of tips and leads, many of which pointed to South Chicago mob. It is believed that Ryan's ties to organized crime groups were created through his gambling ventures. Regardless of what many believe, law enforcement officials were never able to compile enough evidence against any organization or person to charge them with the murder of Raymond John Ryan. And even though, quote, the case is still open, technically, uh, I'm very confident in, uh, that we've identified the people involved and uh, several of them have met their reward <laughs> and some have met their reward in court as well. So.